Dr. Nadelman, for over 20 years you've been an open advocate of intelligent drug policy reform in the US, especially with, in terms of legalizing and regulating the use of marijuana and other drugs rather than criminalizing it. Um, could you tell me in a nutshell why the US government should leave pot smokers alone? Well, I mean, essentially it boils down to the fact that whether or not you or I or anybody else smokes marijuana is none of the government's business. I mean, it's not as if our smoking marijuana is causing any immediate harm to anybody else. And to the extent that there are broader harms and government might sensibly regulate it, like alcohol or tobacco or a range of other products, but just from a simple basis of get the government out of my life, out of my body, out of my home, boils down to that. Beyond that, of course, is the fact that when you criminalize it, the result in my country has been 750,000 people being arrested each year, 90% of them just for marijuana possession charges for a joint. One consequence has been the incredible racial disproportionality in the way marijuana laws are enforced in the United States, and for that many, many other countries as well, including the UK. But where you see, you know, young black men are no more likely to have a joint in their pocket than young white men. But in every city in America, they're two to ten times more likely to be arrested. You have cases of women being deprived of their children because they tested for marijuana. You have hundreds of thousands, millions of people losing their jobs because they tested positive for marijuana use, even though it had no impact on their job performance. It's cost taxpayers tens and tens of billions of dollars over, over the last number of years to enforce these laws. It's thrust the business into the hands of criminals both in the U.S. and outside. I mean, this is truly a policy that makes no sense. Um, speaking about outside the U.S., to what extent do you think prohibitionist measures have negatively affected the states in Latin America and in Southeast Asia? Well, I mean, it's been a disaster. I mean, my own work has actually not been just in my organization, Drug Policy Alliance, focuses in the U.S., but I've been involved internationally ever since my early days advocating uh, for reform. And if you look at it, the consequences around the world of the failed war on drugs have been disastrous perhaps one of the greatest policy failures of the late 20th century and early 21st century. In Latin America, the principal consequences have been the incredible levels of crime and violence and corruption. 100,000 dead in Mexico over the last 10 years and then failed drug wars there. What happened in Colombia a few decades ago, other parts of Latin America, the Caribbean, Central America today. Now you also see it in parts of West Africa, you've seen it in parts of Asia, Afghanistan, where the number one thing in the economy is the illicit opium and heroin markets. So the crime, violence, and corruption associated with a failed prohibitionist policy has been a monumental cost. Beyond that, there's been the way in which the failed prohibitionist drug policies have contributed in a major way to the spread of deadly diseases like HIV AIDS and hepatitis and for that matter overdose fatalities. Hundreds of thousands of people around the world, including in my country, are dead today because the war on drugs blocked the implementation of effective public health measures. So it's really important for us not to lose sight of how dreadful, how, how horribly um, harmful the global war on drugs was over the 20th century and into this century as well. And one of the harms in the U.S. especially, um, I think a couple of years ago you gave a very bold and very interesting TED talk where you mentioned that although the U.S. is home to 5% of the world's population, it is also home to 25% of the world's prison population. So do you think that, there need, that, that something needs to be done in terms of penal reform? Because obviously the criminalization of drugs is adding to this. And do you think that restorative measures of justice rather than punitive measures would be the best step moving forward? I mean, I mean absolutely. I mean, fortunately, my country is beginning to come to its senses in this regard. And it's important to realize that these incredibly high rates of incarceration are not consistent with all of American history. They're mostly a modern phenomenon in which the war on drugs launched by the Nixon administration in the early 70s, and even more so by the Reagan administration in Congress and the first Bush administration, really was the catalyst for this gross, almost unprecedented expansion of the American in prison population. I mean, think about it this way. We rank first in the world in the per capita incarceration of our fellow citizens. Even though our rates of drug use and petty crime are not that much different from Europe, we lock up people at five to seven times the rate of most European countries. 
China has almost five times our population, but only half the number of people behind bars that we have. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the history of democratic societies. And when you look at the consequences, especially for young men of color, and especially African American men, African Americans make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but almost 50% of the incarcerated population. The war on drugs, these incredibly harsh penalties, these dragnets of arresting people, mostly young people of color, you know, I mean, it ha had the impact of driving this mass incarceration in the United States in the 80s, the 90s, and 2000s. And only now are we finally beginning to see that diminish with President Obama, with Democrats and Republicans in Congress, with state leaders all saying we went too far. And do you think that this will diminish and that there will be a policy shift within your lifetime? Oh, there already is. I mean, I mean, leave aside the marijuana thing, which is moving incredibly rapidly. It's really fascinating. If you line up the, you know, the most famous public opinion poll in the U.S. is the Gallup poll. And if you look at the Gallup poll on support for legalizing marijuana and on the Gallup poll for marriage equality, gay marriage, what you see is that from 2004 to 2014, they line up almost exactly. Right, from roughly 33% of the population in favor 12 years ago to 53% in favor within the last year or two. So it's been a monumental social transformation. But with respect to the broader drug war, we're now seeing um, more and more states reduce their prison population. We're seeing movement in Congress to cut this back. I'm very proud of the fact that my organization, the Drug Policy Alliance, was really the pioneer of most of the major sentencing reforms. My state, New York, has led the country in reducing prison and jail populations, and our work helped contribute to that. Same thing you're beginning to see in California now. But here's the challenge. We went from half a million people behind bars in 1980 to 2.3 million people today. All these reforms are in some respects very incremental. So we're going to see the population drop to 2.2 million, 2.1 to 2 million. But my great concern is that people will then sort of slap themselves on the back and say, we've done what we can do. But quite frankly, if America is to once again be average when it comes to incarcerating our fellow citizens and residents of the country, we need to cut our prison population by more like more than two-thirds. And that's going to take a really monumental transformation of consciousness. And if America were to legalize marijuana and other drugs or decriminalize it throughout the, the states, with this comes a bundle of very intricate policy questions. So for instance, taxation. Um, would the taxes be based on the weight of drugs, the THC content? Um, would private firms be allowed to enter the market and advertise? Um, will this lead, will, um, if cannabis is legalized in the U.S., will this lead to an increase in usage? How do you go about answering these questions? Well, I'll tell you, I, I mean, there are no great answers. So the first thing I can tell you is that in many respects, it's similar to the repeal of alcohol prohibition in the United States back in 1933. We didn't replace alcohol prohibition with one national system of alcohol control. We had 50 states, or actually 48 back then, each of which implemented their own alcohol control models. And within each state, different towns and counties had their own policies. You had dry towns and dry counties where no alcohol is served over the counter. We still have those today. You had, I think, 18 or 20 states where the government created sort of state-sponsored monopolies over hard liquor, but allowed beer and wine to be sold in, uh, in, in wine stores. Other places like California allow any alcohol to be sold over the counter in supermarkets. I mean, it varies dramatically from one place to another. And I think that's mostly a good thing. And I think, in fact, I know that's the way it's going to evolve, evolve with marijuana as well. Um, the second thing I'll say is that I live in perhaps the most dynamic capitalist society, you know, today, and maybe in history in some respects, America. And that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Now, I hope that other countries, Uruguay became the first country a few years ago to legalize marijuana using a very different model than, than Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska are doing. There's a chance that Canada this year in 2016 can become the second country to legalize marijuana. There's now some discussions in parts of Europe, Switzerland, Czech Republic, Spain, uh, Denmark, about finding ways to legally regulate marijuana. So I'm optimistic that we'll see a proliferation of models, not just in the U.S., where a more private enterprise-driven model is likely to dominate, but I think we'll see other models emerging, and already have, for example, in Europe, that also will provide some good examples for those countries looking to move forward. Jamaica's an interesting case. 
they almost legalized. They, they decriminalized, they legalized religious use by Rastafarians, medical use, they decriminalized possession, they're trying to pro protect the rights of small growers, the Rastas and others who have grown this for a long time. So there's a lot of different models, and that's by and large a good thing. So given this rate of progress, um, if marijuana were to be legalized in the U.S. and in other countries, what would happen to those already incarcerated, to those already behind bars for drug use and possession? Well, well, eventually those people, I think, will be no longer treated as criminals. It's very hard that when you're trying to pass a law, whether through the state, state legislative or federal legislative process in the U.S., or in the U.S. we also have the ballot, in, the ballot initiative process in roughly half our 50 states where citizens can draft a law, collect enough signatures to have it go to a vote of the people. And what we generally find is that the public is willing to support changes in future penalties, but they're reluctant to apply those reductions retroactively. Once, however, we change the law to reduce penalties, then the moral absurdity of continuing to lock up people for long periods of time, uh, for lengths of time, they would no longer be locked up for it if they had been convicted in the future, that then becomes overwhelmingly compelling to sort of roll back the penalties on former, uh, former people who have already served time. We're also having some success, like for example, the California marijuana legalization law that will be voted on this November. We're beginning to build into some of the new laws, the, um, uh, you know, some ways of trying to help people who previously had a conviction. Now, you've built up quite a following over the years for your activism and for your views on drug policy reform. And Rolling Stone magazine even called you the real drug sir. But I wonder, have you ever had a point in your career, or several points, where you've had to sort of take a step back and re-clarify your stance in case that people sometimes would misinterpret it? Well, I'll tell you, uh, you know, on the one hand, my basic view of drug policy has not shifted in any significant way since I first began advocating for reform back in the late 80s. The basic view that drug policy should seek to reduce both the harms of drugs, the death, disease, crime, and suffering, and the harms of the government's prohibitionist policies, crime, violence, corruption, adulterated drugs, all that, that's been consistent throughout. The basic view that there is no inherent reason why these markets need to be criminalized, and that what we should seek to do is to reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system in drug control as much as possible while stopping short at that point at which public health is really, um, is really endangered. That's been a consistent view throughout. Now, one of the good things is that when I first began in the late 80s, it was, I mean, it was crazy days back then. We had a monumental war on drugs. It, it was like McCarthyism on steroids. And, and, and the, the, my, the extent to which I was misunderstood and misinterpreted then was really, I mean, really challenging. I mean, people say, oh, you're just trying to promote drug use by kids, you're just a pro-drug person, you don't care about this. And of course, it was not at all what I was saying, but people couldn't even hear it. One mark of our success is that as our views have increasingly become the mainstream views, without our changing our views at all, people are more and more understanding, more and more they get it. The dialogues are becoming more sophisticated. Not universally, not everywhere around the world, not even everywhere around America, but there really has been significant progress in that regard. And in the late 80s, when you first took up drug, act, drug policy reform activism, what, was there anything in particular that drew you to this, particular, to this field of activism and made you certain that this is what you want to commit your career to? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, if I ask why I do what I do, I mean, part of it was growing up in a fairly religious, moral family. My father was a rabbi, you know, Sabbath observant. Then going off to college at McGill University in Montreal and beginning to smoke cannabis um, and, you know, enjoying it as I did alcohol, but wondering why people were, you know, why were people being arrested for this? Why were they being harassed at the border? And then I you know, went off to Harvard, you know, one of the best universities in America, and many of my friends and I, we smoked marijuana, and we still did very, very well. I mean, all this notion that you couldn't smoke marijuana and be a successful student. Then I came and spent a year at LSE in 1979-80 doing my MSc in International Relations. And I remember our feeling of paranoia if we'd have a little hashish in our pocket about, oh my God, the police could arrest us and stop us. And meanwhile, you see this gross drunkenness 
which sometimes I myself was participating in, but I mean, this gross drunkenness with alcohol and all of the rowdiness and ugliness with that. And meanwhile, you just wanted to have a puff off a joint and you had to worry about the police busting you. So on some level, it kind of hit home personally. And then the other part of it was, I think on some level, I realized only retrospectively, I needed my intellectual pursuits to be linked to something I felt passionate about, personally, politically, ideologically. And in a way, the fact that I was an illicit drug user, still am today, um, gave it a certain personal hook. And at the same time, intellectually, the fact that all the science and all the evidence suggested that drug policy should look like this, public health, you know, da, 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 but all the politics were driving it here, that struck me as a fascinating intellectual puzzle and something worth devoting a lifetime to. And um, did your time at LSC influence your views in any ways? Well, you know, back then, I mean, my focus was more on international relations, Middle East politics, and uh, uh, that was something that was also quite personal to me as well. Um, you know, as somebody who'd grown up Jewish and whose, you know, family had fled from, uh, you know, Berlin and the Holocaust and all that. And I think in some respects, um, I, I was initially drawn to Middle East politics and was focusing on that here. But that, in a way, was also too painful and too close. And in a way, the drug thing was close, but not quite so painful. You know, so I, I don't know the time at LSE had a huge impact on me, except to reinforce my views that cannabis was a lot safer than booze. And um, many high-profile figures, such as Ariana Huffington, George Soros, um, they've all support, um, voiced their, their support of drug decriminalization. And even Morgan Freeman very famously said, never give up the ganja. So I was wondering, um, usually people talk about political leadership and the necessity of political leadership in activism. How big a role do you think is leadership and activism in the public sphere? It's pivotal. I mean, keep in mind, leadership can come at any level. It can come from former presidents and current presidents and governors and senators and legislators and parliamentarians, people like that. It can come from famous celebrities. Um, but it can also come from people who are students, from people who are grassroots activists, from, from people who are active drug users and begin to mobilize on behalf of their own rights, from, from parents who have lost a kid to a, a, a drug overdose and realize it wasn't the drugs that killed their kid, it was the system. System, the prohibitionist system that made the drug so much more dangerous and resulted in the death of their child. Now, with respect to some of the people you mentioned, I mean, George Soros, God bless him, because he, you know, I was teaching at Princeton in the late 80s and early 90s and writing and speaking about all this. And then one day in the summer of 92, I got a phone call out of the blue inviting me to lunch with, with George Soros. And, you know, he was intrigued by the drug issue for many of the same reasons he was interested in advancing human rights around the world and promoting open societies in the tradition of Karl Popper, the famous LSC professor. And we hit it off. And one thing led to another where we formed a partnership that enabled us to turn these ideas of reform into real action. So that was pivotal. Ariana Huffington, when she stepped out 15 years ago and became our ally on drug policy reform, that was before most others were ready to step out. And her ability to engage the media and attract attention was hugely valuable. Now, you have this uh, Global Commission on Drug Policy headed by former presidents from Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, uh, Switzerland, uh, Portugal, a range of others, and Richard Branson, and George Shultz, the former Republican U.S. Secretary of more or less everything, and Paul Volcker, the former Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. And, you know, when guys like that and women like that put their name and attach their name behind a perspective, that had previously been regarded as highly controversial or even radical, that helps to legitimize it in a huge way. When Richard Branson decides to commit, make this one of his true passions, and is always out there working with us to open this up, when he recruits Morgan Freeman to provide the voiceover for his fantastic documentary, Breaking the Taboo, all those things help. Um, so, you know, anytime a person who is respected by large numbers of people steps out, it helps. 
And what advice would you give young students or young activists who want to build on the work of the Drug Policy Alliance and push for the legalization of marijuana in their countries or in the U.S. or elsewhere? Well, the first thing I would say is don't just focus on legalizing marijuana because that's one piece of the drug war. It accounts for a majority or half of all the drug arrests, but not for most of the people behind bars. It's not the one creating the huge harm. So I would say first, don't focus just on marijuana reform. Focus more broadly on ending the whole war on drugs and promoting a more science-based, health-based drug policy. The second thing I would say is if you really are passionate about this, learn everything you can. I mean, I just spent years in the libraries reading everything I possibly can and trying to talk to people and watch everything. And I mean, the more you know, the more effective advocate you will be. The third thing I would say is understand that effective advocacy is not just about self-expression. It's about thinking about the ways in which one moves other people to a new way of thinking. It's about learning to use language and ideas and to communicate effectively. It's not just saying whatever you believe, because oftentimes that can go backwards. Fourthly, if you in fact do use marijuana or other illicit drugs or even legal drugs, do so responsibly. Right? Every drug, even marijuana, can be addictive, can be problematic. You know, for young people who are waking and baking, you know, waking up in the morning, smoking marijuana and not really paying attention, not a good thing. For people who are smoking too much or getting in trouble with other drugs, or if you're going to use psychedelics, psychedelics can be an incredibly positive thing in somebody's life, but they also can be risky if you do it in a stupid way. So it's important about being responsible as well. And finally, with the, um, with the United Nations General Assembly's special session on drugs coming up in April, how important do you think U.S. participation should, uh, will be in this? And what sort of steps do you think the U.S. should be taking? Well, it will be fantastically helpful if President Obama decides to come and speak at the U.N. event in April in New York. I, I, I'm not optimistic, but his coming there would result in many other heads of state coming. It would increase the media attention, and all that would be for the good. Especially because President Obama, in, in the last couple of years, has been far better on issues of drug policy and criminal justice reform than any president we've had since since probably Jimmy Carter. I mean, it's really significant the way that he and his government have begun to move in the right direction. I think with respect to the politics within the UN, I mean, the good news is that the US is no longer the global champion of the war on drugs. We've sort of handed off that baton to uh, the Russians and left it to some of the Asians and others who want to, and people in the Middle East who want to pursue a still repressive policy. So the US is now kind of in a confused position where domestic politics are, are driving a new posture, a more reform-minded sensibility, where, on the other hand, where the people in the State Department are so used to reading off the same drug war talking points for the last 30 years, they can't quite get around it. So we have all sorts of interesting tensions there, but I'm happy to say that the United States, A, has become a leader when it comes to pragmatic marijuana reform, and B, is no longer providing, no longer playing that terrible role. Still problematic, but nothing like it was in the past decades. And do you see a parallel between Obama's shifting viewpoint on gay marriage and with the, his views on drug? I don't know if he sees it that way or not. I mean, obviously there's this very close connection in the sense that they both involve issues of people's sovereignty over their own minds and bodies. And that the, why should the government criminalize somebody because of their sexual identity or preference? And why should somebody criminalize or punish somebody because of their psychoactive you know, uh, preference or identity? So in that sense, it's fundamentally similar. Um, I think for him, uh, the issue has been to some good extent about the recognition of the human rights atrocity. That, the, that mass incarceration represents in the U.S. and the horrific way in which it's disproportionately targeted at young men of color, especially African American men. I think that's driven him on this. And even on the marijuana issue, I think it's the ways in which it is inequitably enforced that has made him open to what's doing it, what, you know, to, to reform. I think also the fact that, you know, if you look at in the four states that have legalized marijuana now, Washington, Colorado, Oregon, and Alaska, I think maybe with only one exception, 
every one of those votes to legalize marijuana got more votes than the winning candidate from governor and senator did in those states. So that sends a powerful message that in the democratic system, people voting are saying, let's do this, and why should the federal government get in their way? And which presidential candidate do you think would do the most for drug policy reform or be the most progressive? Well, the ones, I mean, the ones who were there, Rand Paul was the Libertarian Republican who would have done a lot in that regard. He dropped out. Bernie Sanders is the one, although he was always a bit com uncomfortable with the marijuana issue, and I had a long conversation with him last summer about this, and I think helped move him along on his thinking about this. Um, but I think he's now taking much bolder positions. Hillary Clinton, I think, is the one who will, I mean, she's basically said she will continue the Obama policies in this area. So I don't think she's passionate about it. I think she'll only do as much as she needs to do politically. I think Obama had a little more heart in it than she does. Um, but I think, uh, I, I think she'll be, uh, I, I think she would be better. Among the Republicans, many of them are just terrible on this. Um, I mean, Trump is unpredictable, so you just don't know. I mean, he's such a wild card. Cruz, although he supported some sentencing reform, is by and large very bad. And then the other more quote-unquote moderate Republicans, the Rubios and Bushes and guys like that, um, they're not, they're very bad on these issues. Uh, Kasich from Ohio, the Ohio governor, who's you know been showing some legs and some effort, you know he'd be a little better. But we're going to be best off at this point with Sanders or Clinton. Okay. And lastly, we asked a couple of students if you could um, ask Ethan Nagelman any question, what would it be? So we got a very original and interesting set of questions. So we'd like to do a very quick rapid fire round. Sure. If there's any question you don't want to answer, just say skip. Are you okay. ready? Yes. Okay. Sativa or indica? Uh, it really depends upon my mood and why I'm using it. I mean, if it's true, I don't know if it is, that sativa is more stimulating and indica more of a body uh, high. It really depends whether it's nighttime or day or what I'm hoping to do. Uh, top shelf or regular? I tend to go for top shelf. You know, and I'm also in the position, in part because of my job, where I, I essentially never buy marijuana. I essentially rely on the kindness of strangers, and strangers oftentimes want to impress me with the quality of their product. Just rolling a bong. Oh, you know, I'll go either way. Although I have to say, I think vaporizers and vaping is the way of the future, and that's a good thing. Smoking or vaping? Yeah, yeah uh, you know, uh, once again, yeah, I, I've, I've been smoking a joint for so long, or out of a pipe for so long, I naturally incline that way. But I think the vaping thing is good. And quite frankly, with edibles, which have emerged so rapidly in America, it's a somewhat different high, and you have to be careful not to take too much because it just puts you to sleep or it's uncomfortable. But I think the edibles are really becoming a new and interesting thing, and I've enjoyed those. Uh, one of the questions is store bought or home edibles? Oh, you know, as the store bought ones are getting better and better quality, mind you, if somebody's a great chef and knows how to put together a good cannabis edible, I'm all game to try it. Blunt or joint? Uh, well, I don't like combining cannabis with tobacco. Um, it was an issue I remember when I was at LSC and the Europeans and others would mix the two. So I really prefer just the cannabis straight, not mixed. Outdoor or indoor bud? I don't care all that much. I, I, I mean, I actually hope that one thing that's happened in America is that preferences, consumer preferences, have shifted towards indoor grow with the kind of you know more pretty buds and all that sort of thing. But I think it would be a good thing to have outdoor grow, um, you know, regain its popularity. I'd love to see the legal marijuana industry emerge, like the wine industry or the microbrewery industry, and where you might label the years and the the can not vineyards but canniers. Some people call the phrase. I think that would be a good thing for cannabis culture and for the economy and for employment. Uh, favorite edible? Oh, I can't remember the name of the brand now, but there's these little, um, there's these chocolates, uh, Kiva or something like that, which I think is a really high quality chocolate and a nice high. Uh, favorite strain? I don't really have one. Okay. Favorite memory while high? Oh, there's just too many to recall. <laughs> uh, then the next one was favorite memory while high during your time at LSE. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Taking you way, way back. Um, you know, once again, I'll tell you the truth, it's much easier, that's a question that's much easier to answer with respect to psychedelics. 
because um, with, with substances like uh, uh, mushrooms or ayahuasca, which I haven't done hundreds of times, but what I've done you know, on occasion, and I think has been played a positive role in my life, those are the memories that are most profound. Marijuana is more commonplace, so it's just hard to be alone. And the final question was, what's your favorite color? I know the memory I have. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know the memory I have. It was the it was in the spring, the spring of 1980, and my girlfriend had come over to visit, and we went over to Paris, and we had a little bit of hash with us. And on the way back, I didn't want to carry it because um, we were crossing a border. This was before the you know, borders were still closed to some extent, and so we swallowed a little bit of the remaining um, hash. Oh, yeah. And on the way back, the ferry from Calais, uh, from Calais to uh, it was in Dover to, to the UK. It was storming that night, and people were throwing up and all this. And my girlfriend and I were just sitting there, and we were enjoying ourselves. We were not nauseous, because you know, marijuana is very good for seasickness and for nausea. And we were just munching away, and people, and that was a very positive memory and experience with cannabis. Um, and the last question was, what's your favorite color? I'd say black. Okay, I think the person who asked that question was hoping you'd say green, but that's just too that's predictable, right. you know. It's too predictable. <laughs> so, yes. Okay, want to keep them guessing. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadal. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you very much. Okay.